Leadership Perpetually is an organization who is dedicated to bringing together leaders who are equipped to amplify community engagement, expand awarenesses of the local challenges, and turn those visions into a brighter future for all of us, into a real reality. And there may be a variety of factors that got us all to come today, but I think we all arrived with one common discovery, and that is collectively we are invested in positive change, an investment where leadership matters and where good ideas can change the lives of men. I would like to thank Leadership Epics for hosting this event and for your partnership. Um, your commitment to creating a stronger, more vibrant, healthier community is inspiring, and Signet is proud to have played a role in supporting your efforts. The strength of the human spirit in these challenging times has been extraordinary and also humble. Now, it's my distinct honor to introduce Chairman Jeff McKay for the State of County Address. As we all know, Jeff McKay was elected Chairman of the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors in November 2019 in the before times. And just as he was putting the puzzle pieces together for his ambitious agenda, the world was rocked by COVID-19 and the pandemic that followed. And it's in times like these, times of crisis, that we learn whether or not people can learn. And there's been no question that Jeff McKay is a true leader. He never wavered, even as decisions on the state and national levels changed in what appear to be random or surprising ways. And we're so fortunate to have Jeff McKay leading us through this current time and into what I know will be a brighter future. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your chairman, Jeff McKay. Thank you very much, uh, Brady, for that kind introduction and, and good morning, everyone. It is good to see uh, so many familiar faces and I, I am glad, uh, Karen, that, that we did this as a Zoom meeting so that we could see each other. Um, I think that's important and, and healthy as we uh, get back to uh, what, what we hope is, is normal here very soon. Uh, but it's a pleasure to be with you and um, let, let me just start off by saying cicadas, really? Did we need something else? Um, but, but in all seriousness, um, I, I have to say, uh, we've been through a lot uh, this last year, as, as Brady uh, well articulated uh, here in the county as well. And I couldn't be more proud uh, sitting here today at, at where we are, um, because we, we've weathered a, a tremendous storm. Uh, we've pivoted. Uh, we've put in place programs and, and opportunities for people to try to get past this pandemic in a way that you would expect. Uh, in Fairfax County, and, and none of us could have expected what we have gone through. Um, but if you think about where we are today, we have uh, well over 50% of the people in the county that have had a dose of vaccine. Uh, we have a community that believes in getting vaccinated as an act of charity uh, to help their community recover uh, from COVID, which is very important. Uh, we have have put in place grant programs to help our small businesses. Uh, this has been a very difficult time for our business community as well as our government community. And we've been bold in putting in place money and programs and grants uh, for our small businesses to survive. Um, and you know, most of those grants have gone to small women and minority owned businesses in Fairfax County, which is important. But I, I really want to focus on, you know, where we go from here, because the, those things are important, but but they're behind us. And that's a good thing. Uh, our board has not missed a beat this year and focusing on all of our priorities, despite the backdrop of a pandemic. And, and we've had some real positive things happen uh, with the help of the EDA. We've we brought new businesses uh, in the midst of this pandemic to Fairfax County that will bring 11000 new jobs to the county. Uh, we've made tremendous progress on affordable housing. Uh, this board has uh, created 1,000 new affordable units and has 600 more in the pipeline, uh, which will be 16, 1,600 affordable housing units in roughly a year's time uh, approved by this board of supervisors, which is remarkable and key to, to our recovery. Uh, we've been very bold on environmental and, and climate change issues, uh, putting in, lar in place the largest solar power uh, procurement and solar power programs on our county buildings of any municipality in Virginia, uh, and we're leading the way on environmental reform. We've modernized our zoning ordinance, uh, rewritten a, a, a document from the 1960s to be bold, to be more responsive to the community, uh, more open for business, but also allow homeowners additional flexibilities, which is important as we uh, think about our new lives after the pandemic. We banned firearms from government buildings. Uh, we've maintained our AAA bond rating. We've expanded our diversion first program and driven our jail population down to one of the lowest level 
uh, in county history. Um, and we've balanced our budget uh, with the help of uh, our support from our federal and state partners. But most importantly, here at the local level, we've balanced our budget uh, even during difficult economic times. So I feel very positive about where we are. Um, every day, more and more people are returning to normal. Our kids are back in school four days a week. Um, and everywhere I go, people are feeling positive about how we have weathered this storm compared to most parts of the country. And so I'm very optimistic about the future. I'm proud of our entire board of supervisors for the work that we've done, uh, not missing a beat on so many of other priorities while making sure that our COVID response was the singular most important thing uh, that we've been working on over the past 14 months and it's paying dividends. You know, when you think about counties and communities that you live in, it's not whether or not you avoid a crisis uh, that makes you successful. What makes you successful is how you respond to it. And if you look at the metrics and the situation that we're in, um, our entire community has responded in overwhelming ways. Uh, Brady mentioned the, the small acts of kindness that so many in our community have extended. Our community-based nonprofits that are running vaccination clinics for us and information campaigns about health and safety. Um, our businesses who, even during difficult times, are, are opening their doors and serving residents and the new heroes uh, in our community, the people who work in retail and deliver packages and have helped keep our economy going, our frontline healthcare workers and first responders, uh, we have much to be grateful for and proud uh, to be living in Fairfax County, um, not just when times are good, but the way we have lived in Fairfax County when times have been tough. So it's an honor uh, to serve as your chairman and to help kick things off today and put, put things in the positive perspective. Uh, we all need more positivity in our lives right now, and hopefully uh, today's program will help build that uh, in each of our minds and keep us grateful for this great community that we're, we're fortunate enough to live in, to work in, uh, to play in, and to be a part of. And so, uh, again, on behalf of the entire Board of Supervisors, thank you, Leadership Fairfax, and it's always uh, an honor to join you. Thank you, Chairman. Okay. Um, I am your chair of Leadership Fairfax Board of Directors, and I'm president of my own woman-owned small business, Stepping Stone Consulting, providing IT program management support to government, nonprofits, and small businesses. And I believe the future is bright. When I look back over the last 15 months and what we have gone through as a community as an organization, professionally and personally, I am amazed by what we have done. We have shown our innovation, we have shown our resilience, we have shown our ability to pivot, and we have shown our determination. And that is all impressive. It has come at a great cost, as we all know and we all recognize. But I believe when I look at what we have done together as a community, we are much stronger for it and our future is bright. So with that, I think it's a perfect opportunity to present the Catherine K. Hanley Award for Public Service. This is the 19th year of this award which was instituted to recognize sustained contributions by the public sector, employee, employees of nonprofit partners or appointees to a public board authority or commission. And this year, it is my pleasure to announce that the, the awardee was unanimously recommended. And this year we recognize the Herculean efforts of the woman behind the scenes at Fairfax County, Kathy Muse. Kathy is longtime director of the Department of Procurement and Material Management for Fairfax County, the county's purchasing agent. In that capacity, she oversees an operating budget of $5.4 million and 76 staff with a particular focus on small women and minority owned businesses, awarding over 40% of procurement dollars to those businesses. She is a consummate purchasing professional with over 30 years with experience at the federal, state, and local level. Kathy has held the Certified Public Purchasing Officer designation since 1991, 
Her professional affiliations include the National Institute of Government Purchasing, National Association of Counties, and the Virginia Association of Government Purchasing, and she is currently serves as the chair of the Chief Procurement uh, Officers Committee of the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments and serves on the U.S. Communities and National Associations of Counties, Financial Services, Corporation Advisory Boards. A local girl, she obtained undergraduate and master's degree at the University of Maryland. As regards to the pandemic, Kathy managed an enormous logistical task. In this crisis-driven virtual world, Kathy exercised superb leadership as noted in the following examples. Kathy identified local vendor to make cloth face coverings for all county agency employees, worked with multiple other Northern Virginia localities to source large quantities of required PPE, especially N95 respirators, sponsored and led a national PPE solicitation effort that resulted in contract awards to eight national suppliers with firm fixed pricing, sponsored outreach to the county's nonprofit contractors to offer them opportunities to creatively continue needed services during the pandemic. In response to the pandemic emergency, worked with the Office of Emergency Management to oversee single point ordering and supply branch chief duties for the county. This included the creation of new lines of business within the department to order critically needed items for the first responders, health department, and all other county agencies, personal personnel, receiving, maintaining, and delivering high levels of stock into and from the county logistics center, negotiating the addition of supplemental warehousing space when the logistics center reached 160% capacity. Received, evaluated, and approved multiple agency requests for emergency procurement of services to include contact tracing for the health department, emergency shelter at eight area hotels, lost countless hours of sleep trying to solve the critical the short supply of respirators and gowns to protect staff, maintained all the department normal operations to provide contracting and other services to county agencies, which include the day-to-day -day plus the additional emergency contracting activities, all while shifting department operations to about 75% teleworking. All the while never losing her infectious sense of humor. Now I'd like to invite the Honorable Kate Hanley to share a few uh -huh. comments about Kathy. Ah, the word of this pandemic has been, Kate, you're on mute. Um, but now I'm not. And uh, one of the exciting things, I think the thought on everyone's mind is just what has Kathy, uh, Kathy Muse been procuring? She's known as the Chief Procurement Officer, which is a much more exciting title than director of DPMM, which is, uh, we know it, Department of Person Procurement and Material Management. You know, I read a, a list of the things that department does, all with an ING on the end, apparently. It's purchasing, contracting, non-capital construction, warehousing, a big challenge this year, inventory management, asset accountability, all those things. So what has Kathy been procuring everything from police cars to pencil and paper to school buses to all kinds of equipment to contracts? She has been all these years, not just this very challenging year of the pandemic, helping to keep Fairfax County government running. And while she does that, she's, she's our chief shopper. She's looking out for all the best deals that she can get and how to be sure that we have them on time and then she figures out what many of us try to do is figure out where to put all that stuff. So Kathy, on behalf of the citizens of Fairfax County and the Fairfax County government that serves them, thank you so much for what you have done as our chief procurement officer. Something else you should know about her though I found out besides all those things she procured, she was working with a nonprofit, I think in the Mount Vernon district to get a playground. I didn't I didn't know they came as from through procurement. And also in her spare time, of which there's not been much, she's been teaching English as a second language to um, people who that need help in learning English, as well as citizenship preparation. So Kathy, thank you for what you've done 
for being a terrific asset to Fairfax County, to its citizens, and to being a really fine person to know and uh, serve uh, all of us. Congratulations. Thank you, Kate. Um, and forgive us for two seconds for not completely socially distancing. My name is Cynthia Bailey. I'm the deputy county attorney here in, the, uh, in Fairfax County. And it is my distinct privilege and honor to actually be able to present Kathy uh, with this award. Um, trying to bring it up to the camera. You can see it's just lovely. Um, and it recognizes you for all of your contributions, not just this past year, but really through your tenure um, in Fairfax County. So thank you so much, Kathy. Thank you so much, Cynthia. And thank you very much for those kind words, Chairman Hanley. I am so grateful and humbled by this recognition. It has been, as everyone has said today, a very difficult year, but it has also been a real honor and pleasure to be able to serve and be part of the solution. And I just wanna say that I accomplished none of this by myself. So I share this recognition with the, the whole department and all the community partners, as well as the departments that we work with to provide the services to the citizens and to help in this recovery. It has really helped divert us from our own anxieties to be part of the solution. And receiving this recognition just makes it even more worthwhile. So thank you very, very much. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce our MC for this morning. And those of you that have been here before know that you're always in for a treat. Casey Beach, LFI 99, is president of Beach Commercial Real Estate and is former chairman of the Leadership Fairfax Board. For those of you that haven't been here before, you know that Casey brings his charm, wit, and creativity to all he does. He tirelessly contributes his time, talent, and treasure, treasure to numerous organizations in our region and mentors so many young folks in our region and improve the lives of so many. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Casey Beach. Thank you, Karen. So I'm never going to live up to that. So you're going to see a lot of, a lot of hate mail in the chat soon for that one. That was, that was good. Thank you for that. Um, so, I mean, people know, who know me. I love Northern Virginia and I love this event. I love LFI and LFI has such a great impact. I was telling people earlier on this call what a great impact LFI had on my career. And you just get to learn about the great organizations. You get to learn about what, how our government works. You learn about um, you know, the, the police and the fire rescue and the sheriff's offices, all these great people who are working to make our community great. And so now we are recruiting for the class of 2022. And, and if you get to apply and get to be a part of it, you will get to experience all the great things that they, these people have gone through. So in that effort, we have a commercial that was done to, uh, to help on the recruiting side from two ELI, uh, two ELI grads of 2017, um, Brian Kincaid and Devin Strebig have done a, a nice little video for us that I think you all are going to enjoy. I should say, I know they're going to enjoy, right, Susan? <laughs> Here we go. Leadership Fairfax is a great program to help young leaders who are turning into their parents. April, you're on mute. You're on mute. Oh, sorry about that. I was just going to say we should circle back on this next week. Do we really need another meeting that could have been an email? Yeah. No, we don't. It could, okay. Oh, heavens, what a sweet puppy. I'm going to reply it all and tell Jan how cute he is. Don't do it. Don't do it. No need to reply all. We all see it. Leadership Fairfax can't save you from becoming your parents, but they can help you become the next great leaders of Fairfax County. Check them out today at leadershipfairfax.org. <laughs> Thank you, Brian and Devin, for doing that for us. Uh, so today, I think uh, Chairman McKay already mentioned this, and I think this is so true. Today is, is a day that we're going to um, really talk about the future. There's a, there's a verse I like to, that a lot of you know in Jeremiah that says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. And that's what we ask the supervisors to do today. We're, 
we're going to hear from the supervisors and they're going to tell us why the future is so bright for Fairfax County. And as a matter of fact, so bright, you're going to see when they do their introductions that they're actually going to have to wear their, their glasses. As a matter of fact, I, I, I'm going to wear my glasses in a second, but I'm not sure I'll be able to read everything if I put them on yet. But most of you know that if you're part of this event, that we bring out the concise side of the politicians because they know that we're going to time them. So when they have their time, when they have 10 seconds left, they're going to see me do this. This is my nice yellow card. And when their time is up, they're going to see the red card. And of course, if they drone on too long beyond their time, they're going to get the dreaded mute symbol in their, in their corner. So we have to make sure that they stay on time, but they always do a really good job about that. So what we're going to do is we're going to start off with a 30 second introduction from each supervisor. And they're, they're going to start off with this uh, answering this question, which is um, they're going to talk about something that they have started doing during the pandemic or some new perspective that they have gained during the pandemic that they want to maintain um, as, the, as they move forward. So they get 30 seconds to do this. We'll put our shade. I have my Ray-Bans today, so we're going to have that because the future is so bright, as everybody's been alluding to. We're going to start off with Supervisor Dan Stork from the Mount Vernon District. We can pull him up and we'll have Supervisor Stork uh, give us his perspective or some new thing he's been doing since he has, uh, since the, uh, that he's started doing during the pandemic. Did we lose him? I'm here. I'm here for you, Casey. Thank you, Supervisor Stork. It's a pleasure to be here, and and we have the the perspective we have is how do we survive when everything that's uh, key parts of Mount Vernon District shut down? So uh, that shutdown has been hospitality across the board. We um, restaurants, hospitality, events. When you try to go see history, and history's not open to you because uh, COVID, you you know you're going to have to be really careful and and try to find a way to do that that uh, doesn't allow you to uh, get too close to anyone, but also gives you a chance to see the beauty of the area around you. So it's, it's been a tough one for us and, and one we've, we've been trying to, to figure out and, and move forward with. Perfect, man. You set, the, you set the standard, Supervisor Stork. We appreciate it. And then what glasses are you wearing today? Oh my gosh, sir. I almost forgot them. Only the coolest ones. How about that? Very nice. Very the, sun, nice. the sun's shining right on me, too, so I'm ready uh, for it. I love it. Well, thank you, Supervisor Stork. So now we're going to go to Vice Chair and Supervisor Penny Gross from the Mason District. Good morning. Two quick things. One is, after 24 years of almost never being home for dinner with my husband, in the last year and a half, I've been home almost every night. So that's sort of been nice after 50 years of marriage. Um, but the other thing that I've discovered is that, especially during December, January, and February, when everyone was trying to register for the vaccines, I talked to so many elderly people, folks who were 80, 85, 90, who were terrified that they were going to die before they got their shots. And so trying to assuage their fear and reduce their stress was something that I was doing every day along with the staff in my office. That was something we had not anticipated. So I, I think that, that's, that's really what, what I've seen sort of personally and professionally. Thank you very much, Supervisor Gross. So now we're gonna move to Supervisor Faust. I can't wait to see what his, I'm gonna go to my, my Blu-ray ones. I'm gonna go to this one. So Supervisor Faust, what do you, what do you have there? Oh, nice. Morning. Uh, it, uh, it's nice to see everyone. Congratulations, Kathy Muse. You're amazing. Uh, I think that uh, the thing that uh, my perspective changed on what my role is and how important the, the county's uh, role is, along with its uh, partners in the community. Uh, the, the pandemic had a disproportionate impact on uh, areas of our community, uh, Hispanic and other minority groups. And we now are, we need to focus more on ensuring uh, good jobs are available to them, healthcare delivery. Uh, we're focused more on affordable housing than we've ever been. 
and uh, just generally uh, working, uh, pri changing our priorities or, or working on things that uh, were always important but are even more important now. Excellent, thank you, Supervisor Faust. And now we're going to uh, move on to Supervisor Walkinshaw. And this is, the, this is great because Supervisor Walkinshaw, this is his first time being able to be on and actually be, to, oh, look at man. That's a cool looking guy. I'm not even sure that's a supervisor. That's somebody in GQ magazine or something. What's going on there? Well, yeah. Thanks, Casey. The, I actually, you helped me learn that I do not own a pair of sunglasses. Uh, these are my wife's sunglasses. She, <laughs> she let me wear them. So if they look good, it's because she picked them out. Uh, You're very me, secure but, in your manhood. I like that. That's very good. Yeah. So. yeah. Um, you know, I, we've had a, a big personal life change during the pandemic. So one thing I've been doing that I wasn't doing before is, is changing diapers and, uh, and bottle feeding. Uh, we, we welcomed, uh, Mateo almost, almost eight months ago. So it's been, uh, a blessing to be able to spend more time with, with him and, and, uh, with my wife, Abed, than we would have absent the pandemic, uh, in terms of, my role as a supervisor during the pandemic, I mean, one perspective that I, I learned was just the way that our neighborhoods came together to support each other, food drives to help each other, checking on elderly neighbors was really a wonderful thing to see. So I look forward to that continuing. Thank great. you. Casey. Thank you. That's great. That's very good perspective. So now we're going to move on to Supervisor Lusk and we'll see what, what cool shades he has on today. So I'm delighted to be here, and I'll say uh, the best class is a class of 1998 for those uh, who are paying attention. Um, perspective, I'll say um, public service in action, in that the county has a significant role, and we've stepped in, leaned in, to address the needs that we've identified through this pandemic. And I'm very proud, as the chairman indicated, of the things that we were able to do. Personally, I'll say spending time with my youngest daughter and being able to watch Netflix with her and to look at some of the, and this is a point in our family, we don't like horror movies, but my daughter and I decided that we would together kind of venture into watching some horror movies. So every Friday night was she and I watching movies together. I hope to continue to do that as long as she will let me. So again, thank you very much, Casey. That is excellent. So we have one of your fellow UVA grads next. We have Supervisor Alcorn, who is um, coming up here. We'll get what, what his perspective is. All right. Yeah, Hello, there Casey. There we go. There we go. All right. Like Supervisor Walkinshaw, uh, these are my wife's. Uh, I, <laughs> mine are in the car, and I didn't have a chance to go out and grab them. Um, but, you know, today I actually want to uh, share something on uh, – We've talked a lot about public health and focused a lot during the last year, but let's not forget personal health. And that's uh, something that I have started doing uh, during the pandemic. Um, used to be I would work out a couple of times, maybe three times a week. Now I'm doing it every day and uh, has a little bit to do with the pandemic, probably more to do with the fact I had triple bypass surgery last year. Uh, so my recommendation is listen to your bodies. Uh, and do something about it when it says something to you, and uh, and you actually feel better for it. So, thank, thank you very much, Casey. When we're we're very happy for your recovery, and you're doing great, and keep up the good work on that. We're we're obviously that was a scare that we all had for you, but really glad to hear see you back. And so now um, I'm going to welcome Supervisor Kathy Smith, and then um, also Kathy, our condolences to you. We know you we lost you lost your mom last week, and and we really appreciate you. Um, you know, we offer our condolences, of course, and we really appreciate you taking the time to be with us today because I know it's been a tough week for you. So thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you, Casey. Um, it has been a tough year and I lost my dad to COVID in January. So it's been a tough year. And those of you that know me for a while know that I look a little differently. And so my <laughs> motto is let it grow. <laughs> so, so, you know, I had my last haircut January of 2020 and then... <laughs> Came. And I usually got a haircut about every eight weeks. And um, I, I was one of those um, 43,000 people that signed up for the vaccine on um, January 18th, got my second vaccine 
mid-March. So by the end of March, I, I did get a little bit of a haircut. But I think through these times, as, as we're learning how to change and pivot, I just think every now and then, you know, you got to tell yourself, let it grow. I love it. Great perspective. Great perspective. Thank you, Supervisor Thank Smith. You. So now we have, um, I'm going to be very interested to see what these sunglasses look like. We're going to go to Supervisor Harity and see, um, the, the, again, the, the brightness of the future of Fairfax County. All the supervisors are stepping right up with this. What is supervisor? Oh, boy, there we go. It even matches your jacket. There you go. There you go. Well, I, you know, I'd love to say uh, that I want to keep wearing shorts to uh, to meetings, but that probably <laughs> isn't realistic. So, uh, but uh, I, I, I'm wearing them right now, to be truthful. But go ahead. Well, uh, you, you and me both. Um, but I'd love to say that um, you know what I got kind of personally was a renewed appreciation from the outdoors. Everything from outdoor music to outdoor dining to you know walking the dog and talking to neighborhood neighbors who are spending more time outdoors. And I hope that's something that continues. Uh, it's going to be something that continues for me, but also for. Uh, but in the uh, in terms of the community front, I'm going to echo what I think Supervisor Walkinshaw said. Just the way our community came together, and our neighborhoods, you know, organizing fire pits and uh, food trucks, and and really got together to help carry the community together and keep kids busy. Great, that's that's excellent. Yeah, I I agree with that too. I think that's so incredible. So now. We have Supervisor Palchik from the Providence District. And I know she's gonna, I think she was outside walking around the other day. She probably had her sunglasses on then, knowing how bright the future is of Fairfax County. So there she is. And oh yeah. Oh yeah, <laughs> there we go. Well, You're good morning. Out there in the mosaic. I love it. So yeah, so one of the things I discovered is I can walk to Mosaic. Um, got across Route 50, but it is a nice, pleasant walk. Um but also biking. These sunglasses actually are my only remaining unbroken pair right now. Uh, and they were, they were a gift from Freedom Hill Elementary School Bike to School Day, um, which tomorrow is Bike to Work Day. So happy that I, I can wear these today. Uh, walking, biking are two things I love to do. And um, having moved back here from DC, excited to be able to push along with my colleagues a lot of those projects. So um, very excited um, to be able to do that. Another big thing is I used to be very afraid of being in front of the camera. I used to be behind <laughs> the camera, um, but spent a lot of time on Univision and Telemundo this year and on these cameras and um, being a, a half, but about more extrovert than introvert. Um, miss my colleagues, miss the community. Uh, excited to see them again. Uh, but I did grow an appreciation for really um, spending more time with my family from those closest to me, my parents, um, and with my partner who now became my husband. And so um, the people who matter to us, I think matter to us even more this year. Um, appreciate we had the time, like S Supervisor Gross, to spend more time with them. Generally, we are not at home much. Um, and, and don't forget the dogs. My pug got me through the <laughs> pandemic, so, our Thanks, pug. Man. So Thank you, Casey, and excited for um, brighter days ahead. Well, I, I can assure you, you look very good on camera. You're in good shape there, so you don't have to worry about that at all. So, so now we're going to move on to our um, one-minute questions. And again, um, you know, we'll have the same, the same idea here, and, and each of the supervisors is going to – hopefully we're going to get to two questions. We'll see how, how our time goes if once uh, our, our leader of leaders, Ms. Uh, Karen Cleveland tells us when we when we have to stop. So we're going to start with going back to Supervisor Stork, who I will say has the distinction of being the first supervisor to get back to me this year. So I'll have to send him a prize in the mail later. So um, Supervisor Stork. So in the tourism industry has you know is, is a very big a key provider of jobs in your district. So I just want to see how you see them getting back on their feet as as we come out of the pandemic. I think the main thing. Casey is exactly what history teaches us, which is, you know, things come in cycles and what happens now is going to eventually change and become something else. So the first step is, frankly, for the, the core part of our history, that which is a core part of the tourism industry, particularly in the in the 
Southeast area is that, you know, pandemics, if you will, come and go. And, and yes, this is a particularly impactful one for all of us, but uh, we can emerge, we can survive, and we can grow from it. So we've, we've done a number of things. One, is we have a tourism task force, which has brought folks together and made sure that we have the resources and, frankly, the co the kind of partnering that we're doing. Uh, Visit Fairfax has done a great job of, of really bringing people together as well. We've got a campaign that's getting ready to start. Fix folks are opening up their, their sites. And, and, you know, we just need people, frankly, in our area to understand that uh, we're open for business, meaning whether it's uh, Mount Vernon or the National Museum of the Army, which opens up uh, January, uh, June 14th, they're all open for business and ready to go. And we just need folks in the area to start coming and seeing what we've got because it's been a while. And I think we're all anxious to get out of the house and, and frankly, get gone. Right. And, and how many visitors a year does Mount Vernon have? It gets about a million visitors a year. And so they, they've been it's been a tough year for them. Very tough year for them. Yeah, that's well. We, we hope that, that they get back on their feet quickly. Thank you for that. That is great. So now we're going to go to uh, Vice Chair uh, Penny Gross. And um, you are the longest serving um, member of the current board. Is it 26 years? Is that correct? Starting my, yes, I'm in my 26th year. That, that, is, that is awesome. Thank you for your service here. So um, what do we want the county to look like to our grandchildren? You know, I've given that a lot of thought because um, 24 years, 26 years ago when I got elected, you know, all, anybody who was born then is now having their own families. Um, I think I want one Fairfax to really be robust. I want our community to be more diverse and more understanding. Um, I'd like to see more trees and parks and bikes and trails, the pedestrian things, homes that they can afford, a menu of choices. When Mateo Walkinshaw is ready to start his own family. I want him to be able to live here in Fairfax County. I also would like to see fewer trolls on internet sites. Mm. Thank you. you on that, 100%. That is great. That'll do it. Thank you. Well, you, you, are, you are quick. You, you're going to get the record for the shortest answer of all time. So that, that good for you, Supervisor. We're going to get a pack a lot into less than a minute. I love it. Um, so now we're going to go to Supervisor John Faust. The, you know, the, the, despite the pandemic, you've had, there's been multiple infrastructure projects that have been completed in your district. And, and what are you going to do um, to celebrate those? And what are those that have, that have happened in your district? Well, uh, yeah, you know, county staff uh, did an amazing job throughout the uh, pandemic of keeping projects moving forward and getting things done that are essential to the quality of life of our community. Uh, typically, projects take multiple years, uh, and at the end, we like to celebrate. Uh, we normally have uh, ribbon cuttings and uh, congratulate each other for our perseverance and hard work and uh, thank the community for their support. We haven't been able to do that for the past year, so there's several projects backed up that need to be, you know, the ribbons need to be cut and the celebrations need to be had. Uh, one in particular I would point to is what I call my Northwest Street uh, Trail sidewalk, uh, which came to me in 2010, May 2010, and it was completed during the pandemic of 2020. Uh, it, it's a type of project that uh, you just appreciate the community's patience. Uh, they, the community invited me to their Halloween parties every year for 10 years to find mm -hmm. out the status of this project which we finally, uh, uh, and I attended nine of the 10. Uh, so it's time to celebrate with them and to, to thank them for uh, you know, the, the support they've given us and to celebrate what is now a very, very important connection uh, to a major sidewalk network. Yep, that's great. And I love the fact we're gonna go back to ribbon cuttings. That'll be, that'll be nice, that'll be nice. Great, thank you, Supervisor Faust. So now we're gonna go to Supervisor Walkinshaw. Um, so, um, and, and you all actually, Supervisor Harity and you have already alluded to this, um, that one of the most important things about being a supervisor is building community and bringing community together. Can you tell us some of the plans you have to bring the community together as we emerge from the pandemic? Yeah, thanks, Casey. So a couple of things that I'm really excited about. Uh, one, probably a lot of folks uh, on this meeting uh, might want to participate in, but we have had throughout the pandemic uh, in front of the Braddock District Office, 
two beautiful benches. Um, one dedicated to former Braddock District Supervisor Sharon Bulova and one dedicated to former Braddock District Supervisor John Cook. And we have been waiting and waiting and nice. waiting to do that uh, dedication ceremony to bring the Braddock District together. I know Chairman McKay will be there with us. So I'm looking forward to doing that. All of you are invited uh, to that and we'll share the details on that. Uh, another thing I'm very excited about, in addition to restarting our Braddock Nights uh, summer concert series, uh, we're starting a new series, new for the Braddock District, uh, Arts in the Park Children's Series. So we will have uh, children's concerts at Wakefield Park every Saturday morning at 10 a.m. We have a huge number of uh, new young families uh, who have moved into the Braddock District, so I'm very excited uh, to bring this opportunity to them starting this July. That's great. Great. Thank you, Supervisor. Well, that's so good. And I think, I think you're right on, you know, we, we really need to bring the community together again. This is, I'm really excited you're going to be doing those things. That's, that's awesome. Um, now we go to Supervisor Lusk. Um, so Supervisor Lusk, you have um, a new uh, community center being built that's going to also do job training and skills training and things like that. And you're also going to have a lot of fun because they're going to have to name it. Now, as an LFI class graduate, as you already said, in 1998, we think it should be called the Lust Center. Oh I'm sure that's not going to be too controversial, but uh, Supervisor Walkinshaw and I are going to put your name in for that. And, and you're going to be, that, that'll be, so I'm sure that won't cause much controversy, but can you give us an update on all that? Casey, for the record, um, I'm not requesting that the center be called <laughs> the Lust Center. Um, we will have a public process. Uh, we're going out to the community now to get feedback on what the future name should be. We're talking to the community about what types of uses should be a part of the center. So when you think about this community, it's been very hard hit by COVID-19. Um, we have residents who make on average about $51,000 a year in a county where our average median income is about 124. Um, we know that there are not many recreational opportunities in this community. So this center is gonna provide that service as well. And then lastly, I'll make the point that I am very focused on trying to help our residents kind of move up ladders of opportunity. And this is something that uh, Supervisor Faust and uh, Supervisor Alcorn and I have talked a lot about, and that is we have to provide supports to help people move into the middle class. So we're gonna have a skill center here providing opportunities to get training in med tech, getting training in the trades and apprenticeship programs and the intent is at the end of this program, they'll have an opportunity to get a job that pays at least 20 to $24 an hour. And that's what we're gonna do at the center. Thank you. And that's the type of good news I think people wanna hear, just the, such good opportunities for, for people to take advantage of. So thank you for sharing that. That's, that I, I think we're all very excited about that for sure. Thank you. Um, so now we have uh, Supervisor Alcorn. Um, and uh, you know, the, the 100 Mill District um, I happen to work in that district, is uh, blessed with a lot of commercial real estate as well as a lot of corporations moving into the area. So what are your plans to use the growth and the new companies coming in to uh, create employment opportunities for people in, in your district and, and beyond, frankly? Well, Casey, thank you for the question. And thank you for having me go right after Supervisor Lusk, because <laughs> you're right. We've talked a lot about this. Um, you know, Reston has been blessed, as have other communities in the Dulles Corridor, uh, with a tremendous amount of economic activity during recent years. Um, and, you know, proximity uh, between our communities that have not really uh, uh, participated in that economic activity, proximity is not a problem for us in Reston. We, we, we are definitely a planned community. Uh, we have, um, we have, now, a challenge of building those bridges. How can we bring folks that haven't participated in communities that haven't really um, made, have gotten the opportunities in many cases to uh, be a part of that economic activity? So in Reston, Casey, as you know, we like to plan and uh, we have an update to the comprehensive plan underway. And we have a subgroup that is looking at equity and public health issues, but particularly on the equity side, you know, where can there be uh, expectations, uh, calls for things like job training uh, as part of the land use process? Where can there be um, apprenticeships? Where can there be other opportunities that are created to build those ladders? So 
very exciting and uh, uh, look forward to keep working with Supervisors Lusk and Faust and others and keep talking about this and figuring it out. So thank you, Casey. Yeah, that, that's great. And I think everybody on this phone or, or on the Zoom call today, the quality of opportunity is so important. And, and so that's what people are looking for. And I think you all, all, all of what you all have been talking about, and I know what the supervisors are trying to do is provide those uh, quality of opportunity, those, the, the opportunities there just for people to work. And so thank you all for what you're doing on that. That's, a, that's great to take advantage of that one for sure. Um, now we're gonna go to Supervisor Smith, uh, affordable housing and development um, of, and a diversified housing stock are very, very important issues to Northern Virginia. There are a lot of groups that are, you know, just don't have the access, right? Or companies don't have access to the employees uh, because of this. So how is Fairfax County doing in addressing um, the, the affordable housing need? Thank you, Casey. Uh, you know, this is such a big prior priority of the board and we're coming at this in so many different ways. A few years ago, we came up with a commitment to add 5,000 more affordable housing units in the next 15 years. And, you know, we're using our public land to help produce a lot of that product. We have, I'm going to just list a few uh, things that are going on. North Hill in, in Mount Vernon, we're going to have 279 units to be constructed by 2022. One university in Braddock District, I'm very excited about this, near George Mason. It's going to be 240 units. Uh, Oakwood and Lee District, that's being worked on. That's 150 units. They're going to close in the summer of 21. And then Autumn Willow, Springfield District, right across the street from Sully District, it's going to be affordable housing um, for our older generation. And that's going to be closing in the spring of 2022. Um, we're also focused on providing more money, our half penny for affordable housing. And uh, we've updated our workforce dwelling unit policy. And when we did our updated zoning ordinance, we added um, a more streamlined way for people to add accessory living units in their homes. And I know those of us that go through the land use process, you know, we're trying to get more affordable units. I've been really happy to work in Sully District with developers that have provided uh, for sale townhouses at 80% of area median income. So we're coming at it all different ways uh, because it's an economic issue too. Thanks, Casey. That's great. Thank you. That's, that's great. That is such an important issue. Thank you for spearheading that. That's just excellent. Uh, now we're going to go to Supervisor Harity. Uh, so during COVID, like, what are some of the positive changes that occurred uh, about the way we do business in Fairfax County? I think um, COVID COVID nineteen forced uh, forced both our county and our businesses to really change the way that uh, that they do business overnight. Uh, one of my favorite jokes has been uh, the one I saw: Who led the digital transformation at your company? The CEO, the CIO, the CTO, or COVID nineteen? But just all of a sudden, we were forced to do things completely different. So, but there's a lot that we learned as a county. And there's a lot we've learned as businesses throughout the county um, in how to do things more efficiently using technology. And, you know, we're going to want to go back to the old way, but everything from permitting, um, you look at my virtual teen job fair, we were able to reach hundreds of more teens doing that virtual job fair than we did when we held it at five individual different schools. Uh, our departments in the county have become more interconnected because all of a sudden they're forced to communicate and see each other through Zoom where they may not have, where, they're, where they may have just passed paper before. Uh, outdoor dining is another thing that I think, and we're, we're looking to keep more of that outdoor dining in Fairfax County, but there's some very positive changes that we've made through the use of technology and other things that I think are going to, uh, going to be good for the county going forward. Yeah. I and, and I can tell you just from an inspection standpoint, you know, people you know, using FaceTime to do inspections and things like that. It was very, very creative ways things were getting done. So that great, great points on that. Thank you for that. Um, Supervisor Palchik, um, I, like I said, I, I know you, this is a, a subject near and dear to your heart. You, you, you've been working hard in your district on more pedestrian and bike friendly, um, being more bike friendly and pedestrian friendly. You were out walking when I was talking to you the other day, looking at things. So. Um, what kind of progress um, are you seeing there? Yeah, Casey, thank you. Well, um, 
if you can ask our transportation team, for me, it's never enough, uh, but there's absolutely some great progress. Um, and what I really love is I had a conversation in the pre-meeting with that team from INOVA, um, chairing our health and human services team and having participated in a, in a Virginia Department of Health um, Institute, Walkability Institute, it's about bringing all of our agencies together. It's not just about transportation, right? I mean, there's a lot that goes well that we love here in Fairfax. Um, and Northern Virginia, traffic's not one of them. Um, but it, as we know, it's not just about traffic, right? So it's about having a healthy community. Uh, one of my CEOs in Tyson said, yeah, bring it on. You know, this is what I need. You're great parks, um, but let's let's help um, improve, um, you know, sidewalks and trails for our young employees we're trying to attract here. Um, got six metro stops in my district, um, tons of buses. I love being able to connect and ride and walk to the bus. And the biggest thing we saw this year, which Supervisor Gross alluded to as well, is what does it mean for equity? You know, we, we saw a huge decline in metro ridership and rail ridership, mm -hmm. but we did not see that in our bus ridership. Right. And so being able to champion walking and biking and connectivity um, a, for a healthy community, for an economically vibrant community, um, but also looking at future options for bus rapid transit and, and really making it a more interconnected and hopefully less car congested uh, community right. moving forward. Great. Thank you. That's, that's great. And thank you for your hard work out there being, you know, on site, just checking things out. That's great. So um, I assume that uh, Chairman McKay is still with us because um, I do have a question for him. Chairman yes, McKay. I am. Excellent. How are you, Chairman McKay? Thank you for a very, very nice uh, state of the county too. Thank you for being concise on that too. Did a great, sure. excellent job. Um, so um, the county is working, um, I guess, to be innovative um, to incentivize more investment in environmental projects and, and projects, you know, uh, those type of infrastructures. Can you tell us about green banks? Yeah, I'd be glad to, because uh, this is something I think is big. We talk about recovering better uh, all the time, and this is a key to doing that. So green bank banks, we had to get legislation passed in Richmond to allow the county to implement green banks. But they, they do three things that are great. One, they encourage public-private partnerships. Uh, two, they help people do the right thing when they're rebuilding or expanding uh, or making environmental improvements for the environment. And three, they give people the flexibility to get access to capital uh, for environmental improvements for their businesses or for their homes that can be very difficult uh, in the regular marketplace. And so what this would allow the county to do is to work with private capital firms, uh, maybe create some seed money to help with this, but to encourage and incentivize availability of capital for environmental improvements and upgrades. And this is really important as we look at some of our older office buildings in the right. county where right. big improvements can be made to help protect our, our environment. Uh, right. And the county has a role to play in help incentivizing those and providing options for people to make those improvements both to their businesses and homes. And so this is about uh, a piece of rebuilding better, smarter, being flexible and utilizing the private sector to work with government to come up with, with good solutions for people. Excellent. Great. Thank you, uh, Chairman McKay. That's, that's great. Great. Because I wasn't aware of it. I heard of it, but I didn't know much. But that's thank you for uh, sharing that with us. So we're going to go back to uh, Supervisor Stork. So what is this? I've heard about this, but what is this about skiing on the county landfill? What is what is that about? Well, and, and we won't have to wait for snow to fall to to make that happen either. Uh, the, the bottom line is that we've got an organization called Fairfax Peak that first uh, came and spoke with me about five years ago that's very interested in building an indoor ski uh, facility. And there's many of them around the world. Um, and this would be the first one, frankly, in our area and one that I think we have a great opportunity. The county and, and the Fairfax Peak have been negotiating. They've been out on site doing engineering and assessments and they, things look very positive for them. And if they're willing to go forward, then then the county will work with them to put together an agreement. We will then take that to the community for a deeper conversation. But in general, the community has been very supportive of, of trying to bring this home, if you will, uh, bring, an, bring another recreational asset to what is already a beautiful area in, in uh, the Workhouse Arts Center and, and the Aquaquan Regional Park. There's a lot of other amenities, recreational amenities in that area that really would make this a, a fantastic addition. Uh, to the rec recreational and, frankly, uh, the enjoyment opportunities that we all would have. That, that's really neat. Are you a skier? I am. 
Yes, I am. Okay. I've, I've enjoyed it. I'm, I'm not sure about the indoor side of it yet, but I'm looking forward to trying that. It'll take a few years to, to get us here, but I think, think things are looking good. And again, the community's been supportive and Fairfax Peak is, has got, seems that they've got all the pieces in place uh, to make this happen, to move this forward. Well, I'm envisioning an LFI class day there, don't you think, Karen? I think that could be a great LFI class day. So thank you for sharing. That's fun, Supervisor Torg. That's, that's great. So now we're going to go back to uh, Supervisor Gross, our vice chairman. Um, this is a good one. That, that, uh, if, if you, many of us take for granted what we have here in Fairfax County. So if you were just someone who came in new to the area and didn't really know much about it, what opportunities do you think we would see that maybe those of us who have been here for a long time just do not see? I'm reminded of a conversation I heard in a, in a at an event one time where somebody said, you know, I was gone for the summer on sabbatical and I was so glad to get back to Fairfax County. And I thought, <laughs> yes, wow, you know, what a great thing to say. When I moved here many, many years ago, this was a bedroom community. It was a suburb of the District of Columbia. Everybody went into town to work. And I think a lot of people still think that's the case. They don't recognize that we're not a monolith, that we have lots and lots of neighborhoods. Um, that, you know, when you fly into National Airport or Dulles, you see how green we actually are. Yeah. I, I think I would be surprised at the breadth of diversity that we have in Fairfax County. Um, I think we also would be um, delighted uh, to know about the free stuff that's available in the county, the free concerts, which are one of my favorites. That's the way I spend my summer vacation one hour at a time. Um, the parks, the museums, these are free. Um, we also have a world-class health system. And I think that that's something that a lot of people would not recognize. And so really we want to, it, it, we've always known it's a great place to live, work, play, worship, and learn. That's going to be, I think people will find out if they didn't believe it when they come here. We still that's have right. That. Thanks. Yeah, well, I think that um, Jen Siciliano and Tracy White would be glad to hear you saying about the World Class Health System. That I think they're on the call today. So well, remember that I, I represent the county on the Nova Board of Trustees. So I had to get that. There you go. <laughs> there you go. So, yeah, we have a Nova and HCA, two outstanding organizations. So being on this, thanks for mentioning that. That's, that's great. Um, so now we're going to go to Supervisor Faust. He is ready, always ready. Um, I know that. Uh, so Pivot and Thrive is a part of the economic plan for the county. Um, how have you used the federal funds to help businesses in the community and, and has it had a positive impact? Okay, thank you, Tracy. Uh, you know, just about everything our board's done over the past year has uh, involving uh, our support for small businesses has been unprecedented. Uh, and I just want to say that I believe that the leadership of, uh, under the leadership of Chairman Kay and really the collective wisdom of a, a unanimous board on all these issues. Uh, I, I think we've developed some great programs and, and done a lot of good. Uh, we used federal money initially to help as many small businesses as we possibly could when the uh, virus first hit. We ended up with a program that uh, uh, gave, uh, we called it uh, RISE, and it uh, gave uh, uh, 5,000, almost 5,000 grants for over 50 $52 million to small businesses, almost 70% of which were uh, small women-owned, minority-owned, uh, veteran-owned businesses. That program worked spectacularly in terms of helping people get through. Now we're at uh, the stage where we're trying to move forward, and we're looking at what we call Pivot and uh, uh, Thrive. Pivot will be another grant program targeted at the industries that were hit the hardest by this, like retail, restaurant, hospitality, and arts foundations, uh, and Thrive will be more just help those businesses. Uh, that'll be a grant program, Pivot. Thrive will be assistance on a broader scale to make things even better going forward than they were before the um, virus hit. That's great. You see that in the chat room there, um, that, that Karen says she's very grateful for the RISE grant that, that went out. So that, that is great. Thank you for sharing that, Supervisor. <coughs> Excellent. Excellent. Um, so now we're going to go back to Supervisor James Walkinshaw. Um, so we say that uh, former Chairman Sharon Bulova, I think Kate Hanley will enjoy this, was, was uh, sometimes called the mother of VRE. 
So the Virginia Railway Express um, is, uh, I guess it, you said, I think you told me 20,000 passengers a day. And um, it also has three stops in your district. So what is the, um, you know, we spent a lot of time talking about phase two of Metro. Um, what, what's the future looking like for VRE? Sure. And uh, Supervisor Gross and Harity are here. So I'll note there's, there's one stop in the Braddock District and there are two just outside of the Braddock District in the Mason and Springfield Districts. But I, I think it's safe to say that probably a plurality of riders are, are from the Braddock District. And I should put my sunglasses on because I think the future of VRE is very bright. Um, riders are already returning post pandemic and before the pandemic, uh, we had a plan to double ridership from 20,000 per day to 40,000 per day. So over the next 10 to 20 years, we're going to be expanding from the kind of railroad that it was when Sharon Bolova founded it, which was designed to move federal employees to their offices downtown at 9 a.m. and home at 5 p.m. Mm -hmm. And we know that all of our workplaces, including the federal workforce, looks a lot different than that now. So we're going to be expanding evening service, uh, hopefully expanding to weekend service to turn BRE into a true commuter rail system over the next 10 to 20 years. So very excited about that. And two of my colleagues, Supervisor Stork and Alcorn, uh, serve with me on the BRE operations board. So we're yes. working together on that. Excellent. Thank you for sharing that because I think we all, a lot of us do. If you don't live in those areas, you just kind of forget about it. And that's it's just such an important um, uh, mode of transportation. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, we're going to move over now to Supervisor Lusk, who is still recovering from our comments of uh, trying to name the, the uh, community center after him. Um, now, last year, I know you have some more real positive news because last year you shared on this call about um, the, your food uh, distribution project, which talks about food insecurity or trying to address that. And it was launched. So here we are a year later, you're gonna hit us with some uh, good news here. Yeah, so uh, I'm happy to report that after a year, uh, we've been able to provide some significant assistance to some of the hardest hit residents in Lee and Mount Vernon, as well as uh, the Springfield areas. Um, so in total, which is kind of an amazing thing, I went ahead and aggregated this, We've done 1.8 million pounds of food, 86,000 boxes, and 60,200 families have been served over the last year. Uh, we're not done. Uh, our program will go through the end of June. And what we're essentially trying to do now is to morph it into a food co-op. And uh, we're working with a number of nonprofits and others to help us do that. But this was a partnership. Went back to Supervisor Walkinshaw's point, we had private sector, public sector, and not-for-profits all coming together to help us address this very important need. So thank you for the opportunity to share that information. And, and that's classic leadership Fairfax, right? Having all the, all the, the you know, government, nonprofit, private sector, and, and, and it's, it's just great to see. One of the reasons I love Fairfax County is just people, you know, they help each other. And again, going back to Walkinshaw and Heritage, what they just said about building community in, in the community, you, and you're another great example of somebody who's been so involved in the community um, through the EDA, through your time on the Planning Commission, all that. So um, that's just great news. And I'm really, it's really just heartening to hear that is going on. So thank you for that. Thank you. Um, so now we're gonna go to Supervisor Alcorn. Um, okay, so we're, we're trying to not be controversial today at all. We've been all uplifting. I think everybody on the, on the call would agree it's been very uplifting. So. This is only slightly controversial, right? So we all know um, that the reopening of schools will affect thousands of people. So it's a loaded question, but when do you think we're gonna see a more normal school operation as it pertains to summer and maybe into September? What, what are we seeing there? Well, as, as the chairman mentioned earlier, we, we are back to four day a week. Uh, I'm confident that by the fall, we'll be back uh, more in terms of the normal schedule for uh, in-person education, in-school education. Um, and obviously it is a loaded question. There are, there are all sorts of issues relating to our education system and the effect on, on children. But what I wanna focus on very briefly is just the impact on the community broadly. And, and it does relate back to some things that Supervis Supervisor Faust was saying earlier about pandemic assistance and recovery. Um, because we've got a lot of folks that uh, for various reasons, have dropped out of the labor force. And that's especially true of, of a lot of women who uh, often assume 
the role of primary caregiver for children. Uh, and this has been an extremely challenging time for, for parents, especially yes. uh, a lot of women, especially a lot of moms uh, in trying to manage both uh, uh, remote education and also caring, uh, caring for children and, and, uh, and in, in keeping going in the workforce. So we're, we're, we're heading into this time where I think getting more folks back into the workforce, perhaps um, that uh, did drop out for one reason or another. And, right. and a lot of it does relate to schools. And I'm very happy, uh, I think we all are, that we're getting back uh, to that uh, in, in school education. So uh, thank you for that loaded question, Casey. Yeah, yeah, it is loaded, but it affects lots and lots of people. So I, I'm, not, and I'm actually gonna, because I'm gonna skip the order here, I'm gonna go to uh, Supervisor Palchik um, because, you know, now more than ever, Supervisor Palachuk, we see um, the importance of daycare and early childhood education. So how, how do we continue to make positive advancements in those areas? Casey, thank you. Yeah, uh, hearing Supervisor Alcorn, um, definitely one of the things we've seen is uh, many women struggling and that our schools have played a role, not just in education, but in providing daycare and a place for our, our students to be. Um, so even before the pandemic, one of the reasons I ran for this board coming from the school board was seeing the high need we had um, for school readiness for birth to age five um, programs in education. We have some excellent programs, um, but it's about expanding those, uh, as Supervisor Lusk was saying, in the community, right? So I uh, I spent a lot of time in one of uh, the Graham Road Community Building, which is a partnership between the schools and the county, um, and one of the areas where we have high needs um, for early childhood. Uh, we just started a, a, a garden there with food for others that I hope will get us through as these um, food distributions come to a close. Um, but we really have to look at, I know he and I also sit on a successful children and youth policy team. And <laughs> while he's uh, championing uh, workforce readiness, I am championing early childhood um, and having meetings to understand there are so many different models. Some are full day and, you know, cost is about $16,000 per, per student. Uh, some are focused and targeted on, um, on moms, on families, on parents, and cost maybe a tenth of that. Um, and so just being able to use the research and be in the community, trusted partners, and understand how to expand um, and very excited about the federal and the state level support um, that we hear and hopefully will continue to come through to help us expand those programs so that more of our, our, our women, our moms, um, my cohort will be able to enter and stay in the workforce. That's great, great. Thank you, Supervisor Palchik. So um, here's, here's what I, I'm gonna give Supervisor Harity the last word here because you were more, Supervisor Palchik was more related to what Supervisor Alcorn was saying and, you know, I think that um, we're giving him the last word, being the only Republican on the board. You know, we're just going to show that we actually are fair on, on this board. So we're, this is it's it's amazing. Um, you're outnumbered nine to one and we're going to let you have the last word. So and it's not even a controversial question. So I, I think we're, we're that's assuming I'm going to ans answer the question. And well, that's a good point. That's a good point. Supervisor, you know, Supervisor Alcorn's a little concerned right now. I know he is. So we have to watch out. So. Here's what we have. So now remember, you got to bring us home because it's been very positive. So this is it. This is your chance. We've got the Leadership Fairfest class on right now. So here's what we got. So we have um, somebody's email box. But so, so we have, here we go. As the pandemic ends, what changes are you most looking forward to? Well, you know, and I'm going to stay positive. The um... <laughs> So the supervisor Alcorn just breathed. Yeah, I just saw him exhale. That was great. Okay. You know, I, I talked earlier about all we learned from, you know, having to go through the digital stuff, but what, what, what I'm most looking forward to, and I think most of the supervisors are, so this will be kind of a unanimous thing, I think, is getting back and interacting more with our citizens in face-to-face -face environments and getting out and doing the things like the free summer concert series. And we got a great one at Burke Lake with, with six great bands and two silos beer and, it's just a national night out so our law enforcement officers can get out and interact with our citizens and we can go along with them. Um, look, you know, the teen job fair, big success. We got a lot of people in, but there's nothing like that face-to-face -face interaction. Looking forward to in-person board meetings. 
there's a lot that goes on in, in person between board members that, you know, is off camera and between meetings and those relations, that's where you develop the relationships. And we got a bunch of board members here that we haven't had the opportunity to do that because they were elected and boom, pandemic, you know, getting back in front of our civic associations and having those real face-to-face -face interactions. So I think it's the face-to-face -face stuff that I'm most, uh, most looking forward to. Uh, it'll mean I'll have to uh, not wear shorts, but um, to meetings. But other than that, it'll be a really good thing. That's right. well, Matt. Thank, thank you for bringing us home. And I think that you know, community and bringing everybody back together. Um, that's exactly right. And I, and I have to thank all of you, all the supervisors. You all were so good as far as being concise and really um, giving really solid answers and, and, and informing this this group that was on here today. Um, and before Karen um, closes it out for us, I just have to tell everybody. Uh, Listen, what you all, it's hard enough being a supervisor in regular times. And now just add on a pandemic, some new board members. I just want to thank all of you for your service to our community. I want to thank you for, you know, putting the time in, enduring the, the trolls as we were talking about. All, all, these, all these things that happen, you all are, are serving our community. We don't always have to agree with everything, but you do need to be thanked and respected for, for dedicating your time and your um, life to helping Fairfax County. So I want I just want to start off by thanking that. Just know that there, there are people who appreciate the fact that what you all are doing out there. Um, and then secondly, for all of our attendees on the phone right now, uh, I know that most of you are on here today because you have an interest or have already been giving back to the community. And even in the Bible, it says Jesus talks about it's more blessed to give than receive. And most of the people on this call understand that. And they, you guys really do give your time, talent, and treasure to our area. And um, one of the things that I, I was fortunate enough to write a, an article for Gam, Gab, Mag, Gam Magazine about generosity. And again, it doesn't just have to be money. It can be time, talent, and treasure. And I just want to encourage you guys, as we know, many of us who, who are, that, that do give, it's Actually, generosity is contagious. So I'm going to end us with saying, please continue to be super spreaders. Be super spreaders of generosity and, and, and really get out there in the community. Continue to support um, everything that the supervisors, you know, support your supervisors, support um, the, the community and all the great things that these nonprofits are doing. And uh, next year, we're going to see everybody in person. And I'm not going to be wearing shorts and Supervisor Harry is not going to be wearing shorts. We're going to, don't worry, we'll dress more like Supervisor Les. We'll be, we'll, we'll be in much better shape. So thank you all. And I'm going to kick it over to Karen. <clears throat> Actually, we're going to turn it back to Kim Stewart, our chair. All right. There we go. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, these are actually my daughters. So I can <laughs> find my own. Following the trend. Everybody's feeling to that. <laughs> but I on. do believe the future is bright. I second what Casey said. Thank you to everyone. Um, thank you to the supervisors. Thank you to Chairman McKay. Thank you to Casey. Thank you for everyone attending. Um, I am inspired by today's discussions. Um, and I think that we have great things ahead of us. We have learned a lot over the uh the last 15 months or so. And I think that we are going to continue our leadership, our innovation, our determination and our creativity. Um, so I'm looking forward to seeing that. And with that, I would also like to do a plug for next year's classes, um, LFI, ELI, LLP. We've got three different programs. We have a, and Karen, correct me if I'm, Wrong, I think the application deadline is June 4th. That's um, correct. Wonderful. So please, if you haven't gone through one of those classes, and you can do two classes or three classes. So, you know, if you've gone through one and you haven't done another one, you know, look ahead and see about applying for a different program. Um, if you have people in your own organization or your neighbors and friends, please, please, please encourage them to check it out and apply. And I do know that uh, we do have open houses that you can join um, to find out a little bit more about it. So with that, I would like to also thank Brady and Cigna um, for being our event sponsor and all of our sponsors. Thank you so much. And I look forward to being in person next year. Thank you all. Have a great summer. Great. Thanks, Kim. Thank you, everyone.
Take care. Thank you. Hi, I'm Joe Fay. We're out here setting up for uh, Hot Meals Meals Distribution. Uh, we do this every night, 365 days a year. It's getting a lot more interesting and a lot tougher, but the need's the same and in fact growing. Last March, as COVID-19 swept into our community, there was never any question that facets would remain on the front lines to serve our neighbors. People's lives were depending on us. In 1988, Linda Wimpy met a homeless family in need of food. One warm meal turned into hot meals every night and Facets was born. Over the years, Facets role in Fairfax County has grown dramatically, but the mission remains the same, a community working together to alleviate the suffering caused by homelessness, poverty, and hunger. These are challenging times for us all, but especially for our most vulnerable and marginalized neighbors. Since March, Facets has had to adapt fast to our changing reality, and you've stood beside us every step of the way to meet the greatest needs of our community. As people worried about their next meal and how to put food on their tables, we increased hot meals distributions and expanded our food assistance to include grocery deliveries and weekly community-based mass food distributions. We're out distributing food this morning. Hi, I'm Jerry Caruso. I'm helping out tonight. We just fed hundreds of people and appreciate everything that everyone is doing for Facets. I'm really grateful for all of the uh, volunteers that come out to help us. For we serve over thousands uh, of, of people uh, when they provide us the food to serve it. With our homeless and unstably housed neighbors facing considerable risk during this crisis, we were able to increase our outreach activities and expand our work to manage an isolation and quarantine shelter. Here at our site, we make sure that our guests have three full meals a day, plus snacks, they have clothing that is purchased new or gently used and donated from our community partners. Also, our guests, they feel safe here. They feel warm, they're out of the elements, and they are safe and secure here at our site. We are so happy when they let us know that they have found a job or permanent housing or learned how to do something new. It's so encouraging to us. It's just as encouraging to us as it is to them. And again, I am so proud to be a part of a team like this. So happy to see the results and so thankful for you and all that you've done to partner with us and make this possible. Often you hear that families are just one paycheck away from being homeless. For the people Facet serves, it can be one circumstance, a loss of a job, an illness, a car repair, or any unexpected expense. During this crisis, as families struggle to keep roofs over their heads, we have been here with financial assistance to prevent evictions, keep utilities on, and pay medical bills. We are so happy that we are able to lend a helping hand during this time. As students and their families face significant struggles and worries about virtual learning and meeting basic needs, FACETS is there ensuring that they receive the support, supplies, and tools they need. Through the support from our community and everyone working together, we can ensure that the most basic needs of all families are met and that our children have the support for virtual learning during our daily homework help program and that they have the supplies they need in order to succeed and to break the cycle of poverty. From all of us on the ECD team, thank you for caring and thank you for your dedicated support. Every day of the week, FACET's program staff are out in the community delivering food, cleaning supplies, and PPE as they provide case management and make connections to life-changing resources. And, as temperatures drop, the doors to our hypothermia shelter remain open 24 hours a day. This season at hypothermia, we're doing things differently. We are, we're here 24 hours a day to make sure that none of our neighbors have to sleep outside during the cold winter months. 
When someone comes to hypo, we try to make the situation as comfortable as possible for them understanding that they are coming in from being homeless, from living in cars, tents, and the woods. It can be really emotional. We know that we may be meeting some of our guests at the worst moments of their lives, so we are here with a warm, safe place to sleep, meals provided by our amazing faith partners and case management to help them connect with resources on their journey to stability. Thank you so much for providing the donations and support we need to operate Hypo this season. What you're doing is amazing and it's really helpful for all of our guests that, that stay at Hypo this year. One of FACET's greatest strengths has been the ability to convene the community to rush to the assistance of those experiencing hardships. It is people from all backgrounds joining together to meet the critical needs among us. It is at these times that you find out just how much more you can do than you thought you could. That is the magic of community. Thank you to our community for helping our neighbors experiencing homelessness, poverty, and hunger. We couldn't do this without you. During these times of challenges and uncertainty, it means so much to know that you are all there for the children, families, and individuals who are struggling and need our help. You are bringing so much promise, relief, and hope. From all of us at FACETS, thank you. On March 13th, everything changed for all of us. With the novel coronavirus pandemic escalating in the United States, a national state of emergency was declared. Businesses and schools across the country were shut down to limit the spread of the disease. Many of our clients were immediately impacted. Ms. Washington, a single mom of two, worked in a store along Richmond Highway. Ms. Washington suffers from asthma and is at higher risk of catching the virus. She called our case manager scared. She needed to pay her rent and put food on the table, but she was afraid if she went to work, she would catch the virus and maybe die, while her employer would allow her to take a leave of absence. She would not get paid for her time away. Thanks to the support of our community, we were able to keep Ms. Washington and her children in their home until she felt she was safe enough to go back to work. Ms. Jones had a different story. Her children are grown and she lives alone. She has worked as a home health care aide for many years. When the pandemic hit, many of her clients reduced visits out of an abundance of caution. Ms. Jones received notice in mid-April that she would be furloughed until further notice. Her employer pledged to bring her back as soon as possible but they could not afford to keep her employed. Even though Ms. Jones applied for unemployment, she feared she would not be able to make her May rent. She called Fairfax County's Coordinated Services Planning for help. They referred her to Good Shepherd Housing. Thanks to the contributions from many of our supporters, we were able to keep Ms. Jones in her home while she waited for her unemployment payments to begin. Today, we can report that Ms. Jones is back at work and remains stably housed. Ms. Samuels is one of our luckier clients. She's remained employed throughout the pandemic and she is thankful for that. However, she has an elementary school child and a middle school child who are both enrolled in Fairfax County Public Schools. When Fairfax made the difficult decision to only start back with distance learning, Ms. Samuels reached out to our office. With the support of our Children's Resources Program, she was able to enroll her children in the county's Supporting Return to School Program. She was able to avoid making a difficult decision about keeping her job or staying home with her children. Here at Good Shepherd Housing, our small staff has remained agile. We have adjusted our programming to meet the dramatically changing needs of our clients. Thanks to the support of Fairfax County and our donors, we have been able to maintain our programs along with our plans to purchase apartments, buying and renovating three since March. We remain committed to increasing the number of affordable homes we can make available because the need for our housing and services 
only become greater in a time of economic uncertainty. Your support makes that possible. Every day, our country and our community demonstrate our resilience in the face of adversity. We are all in this together, and together we will get through this pandemic. Estaba bien mal. Y así fue como todo se fue dando bien rápido porque ella estaba bien mal de salud. Tenía fiebre, congestión, no podía respirar. Ella tenía una distrofia en los adenoides y las amígdalas. El doctor decía siempre que la llevaba a cualquier urgente que era la emergencia que necesitaba operación pero que necesitaba tener los recursos económicos para poder hacérsela. Aquí en este país la salud es bien cara y no todos tenemos acceso. La llevé a, varia, a varios doctores y todos me sugirieron que necesitaba la operación. Fue una feria de salud que hubo en Lorton. Ella muy gentilmente pues, me informó del programa de NCCP para los niños y llevé los documentos que ella me solicitó y pues gracias a Dios fuimos aprobados rápidamente. Gracias a Dios, eh, Kaiser Permanente y el programa de NCCP cubrieron todos los gastos médicos de la operación de mi hija, doctores, enfermeras, nos trataron como, nos trataron especial, un trato especial y nos brindaron toda la ayuda necesaria. El CCP ha ayudado a mis hijos eh, varones con sus eh, examen físico, vacunas, se las pusieron al día y pues el cuidado de sus ojos que fue recomendado por la escuela y pues eh, NCCP ayudó con eso. La verdad que no hay palabras para describir lo que siento, lo agradecida que me siento. Devolverle la salud a un hijo es bien, bien importante. Sentirse, sentir la cobertura, sentirse apoyado, no uno solo. Cuando yo conocí el programa este de NCCP, la vida de mi familia cambió. Cambió la vida de mi hija. Hace dos años, hace dos años, el 4 de julio, ella estaba y pues ella admiraba la piscina con sentimiento y no podía disfrutar. Y este año pues estamos ansiosos esperando el verano porque va a poder disfrutar como una niña, como un niño normal con salud. Cuando uno siente que todo está perdido y, y que nadie puede ayudarle, se entera y se da cuenta pues que hay gente buena, gente altruista, gente que tiene los recursos y que está ahí para ayudarle. Gracias Caice Permanente, gracias en CCP por ayudarnos y pensar en personas como nosotros. Gracias. <música>